Hey, Steve Mignani here from the Junkyard Crawl. You guys probably all know that for the last 18 years, I also do the Barrett Jackson collector car auctions in Scottsdale, Las Vegas, Palm Beach, Florida, and Reno. Well, for the next few days, I'm gonna be at the Las Vegas auction, and I won't be able to be in the junkyard to make fresh videos. So instead, what I'm gonna give you is for six days in a row, 15-minute uh, segments of the 90-minute video, How to Build Altered Wheelbase Funny Cars. Now, this is a DVD I used to sell for $19.95. I made it back in 2007, but it still holds water today. You can actually watch a 63 Dodge Dart turn into a funny car. There's also race footage from the Wilshire Shaker. Uh, there's also a Ford Fairmont altered wheelbase car. So again, for six days, we'll have 15 minutes episodes of how to build an altered wheelbase funny cars running from front to back. And when I get back from Barrett Jackson, we'll get right back to the junkyard. But in the meantime, enjoy how to build altered wheelbase cars starting right now. Vintage photographs once again guide us. Here is that shot from the April 1965 issue of Customs Illustrated showing the kid go with its straight axle, the Dodge van axle up front. But we see here they've moved the front axle four inches forward and basically just clearance the fender. We see the same effect on Gene Snow's original Hemi-powered rambunctious Dodge. Again, the front axle moved forward. This one here looks more like five or six inches, but again, it just shoved forward and they just blast space out of the fender to make room for it. And then finally, the uh, Liberty Motors Corruptors Pup, which was a Hemi-powered 64 Dodge Dart. Again, an A100 straight axle, just move forward. This one here looks probably about four, maybe five inches, but again, move it forward, clear the axle. So we're gonna follow the precedent established by the Jacobs Kid Goat and go for a four inch wheelbase relocation. How do we know where four inches is? Well, we use our original center line with the string and just move that whole thing forward four inches. The great thing about our Dart and most unit construction cars is that the frame horns on the front of the car are perfectly parallel, just like a ladder. In the case of our Dart, there's 30 and 3 quarters inches from center to center. Now that's a number that'll make it real easy for us to mount our leaf springs and straight axle. If there was a Y effect or any kind of a taper to our frame, it would make things a lot more difficult. But again, it's parallel like most Mopars are, and that makes this thing a lot easier. Now the one thing I've got to say is the A100 leaf springs we're going to be using are quite long. They're 46 inches long from center to center. That means we're going to have to build extensions on the frame of our Dodge Dart to accommodate the front shackle. I'll say this, in our defense, historical precedent says that that was a common problem. This is the kid go, and we can see here that they've had to include an additional three, four inches on the front of their frame rail to get those A100 springs in there. So if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for us. Dale, how are we going to go about doing this? Well, Steve, what we did was we cut sections out of the bulkhead to make room for the spring and the shackle when it comes through here. But in order to gain that three or four inches, we're going to add on a piece of two and a half by two and a half square tubing, more than beefy enough for what we want to do. That will give us more than enough to move that spring, get it in place. We shouldn't have any problems. It will do exactly what we want it to do. Very easy fix, not a big deal at all. going to do while we're still putting this front piece on adding the two and a half by two and a half this is all sheet metal mind you these unibody cars are all made with sheet metal now's a good time to close up these spot wells let's reinforce the front end make it a lot stronger than what it was is we've taken some three inch by three inch square tubing. These are going to be the rear mounted brackets for the springs. Very basic, very simple, but it'll do the job. It'll be more than strong enough to take care of uh, this car when it gets its max wedge motor. While Dale's making our leaf spring brackets and shackle mounts, let's take a minute to look at the front leaf spring location on our car. Now we've already used our plumb bob to establish a four inch forward relocation of the front axle center line. So 
As this hangs straight down, all we need to do is put our new leaf spring so its center bolt is in perfect alignment with the plumb bob. That'll give us our four inch forward relocation of the front axle. But here's a quick word about leaf springs themselves. The longer the spring, the better the ride. No, I'm not going all soft here, but there's no doubt that a short leaf spring can result in a very stiff ride. I made the mistake of using 26 inch long leaf springs on the front of an altered wheelbase Ford Fairmont that we'll show you later on in this video. That car rode so stiff when I first put it together, I would have sworn the windshield was gonna break. So another car that I've got is an altered wheelbase Chevy Nova with a big block. We'll show you that one too in a couple of minutes. That car has 33 inch long leaf springs like this one right here. The ride in that car is excellent. So the difference between 26 and 33 inches is the difference between a stiff ride, a horrible ride, and something that's pretty decent. Now in the case of our Darth Dart, because we're using junkyard sourced inexpensive leaf springs from an A100 van, they're 46 inches from eye to eye, it did force us into building a, a leaf uh, a frame extension on the front of the car right here. Not a big deal. Like I say, the kid go and most of those old funny cars had to do the very same thing. So the historical precedent doesn't bother me. So keep in mind, the longer the leaf spring, the better the ride. Another warning, when it comes to leaf springs, you want to be sure not to paint yourself in a corner by welding the brackets and shackles to the frame when they're not loaded. Here's why. Any leaf spring when it's loaded with weight, it becomes flatter and longer. In the case of our A100 leaf springs, they go from 46 inches eye to eye to 47 and a half inches eye to eye with full vehicle weight on them. So, in order to preserve and maintain the proper shackle angle at the front of the leaf spring, we've got to remember to load the leaf spring or at least compensate for it before we attach the shackle bracket to the car. In our case, we're going to be using a special piece of one and a quarter inch diameter tubing that has a one inch inside diameter. This way, our brand new shackle bushings will fit inside here with a slight interference fit. You don't want these things flopping around. And when we come back to the shackle itself, we're going to be welding these tubes to the bottom of our frame rail extension. And then what we're going to do is weld them in so that these are perpendicular, straight up and down. That way, once there's a load on the leaf spring and it becomes longer, these roll back to approximately a 45 degree angle, which is what you want. And a final word on shackles. You don't want to have anything more than four inches distance between the two pins on the shackle. Altering shackle height is a cheap way to get ride height, but you don't want to do that. Anything more than four inches will result in a sloppy handling car. So, let's get started. that is kind of a bummer about the A100 front axle is that it comes out of a very wide vehicle. The stock track on these things is 63 inches. The Dart front track, 56 inches. That's a pretty big difference. The problem is, if we put this axle in the Dart without narrowing it, the front tires will stick out like a clown car. We don't want that. It looks stupid. So what we're going to do is narrow this front axle. Now before we narrow it, of course, I've stripped off the brakes and inspected the kingpins. They're tight. We really lucked out on this junkyard axle. And when it comes down to cutting and welding on forged steel, we've got to go to the expert, Odell. Okay, the idea that we've come up with is pretty simple, pretty basic, but I think it's going to take care of the situation that we need. One of which is we need to clamp that axle down to something rigid, because when we cut this thing and remove our five and a half inches, we don't know whether it's going to spring apart, or, or what. So what we're going to do, I've made, I've taken two just very basic pieces of steel tubing. I've drilled two sets of holes, five and a half inches apart. This is 
The outside set of holes is what's going to hold the axle as I'm cutting. As soon as we're done cutting our center section out, we're going to remove the axle, move it into the second set of holes, and bolt it back up. The reason being is these forged axles are not perfectly square. There are a lot of little idiosyncrasies with them. They are not perfect. But these pads that the leaf springs attach to are. They're very, very straight, very square. So we're going to be using those as our reference point from here on out. She's through. Yep. 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 Okay, now that we've cut this out, we've removed our five and a half inches out of the center. It was pretty non-eventful. We thought maybe it would be spring loaded or something like that, but it didn't do anything like that at all. Now we're ready to take this part of the axle out. And what essentially we're going to do next is we're going to cut this section off and move it away. The only reason why this was here was to hold everything together because we hadn't done that before. Now we're going to cut it away. We'll bolt it back on. We'll make some chamfers with our grinder so that we get better weld penetration. We just can't weld on the surface of this. This is a pretty thick piece of forged steel. We're going to grind and make what's called a fillet weld. We're going to grind a whole lot down here, almost down to nothing, and then we're going to fill it back in with an arc welder. Now some people say, why an arc welder? Well. This is exactly the tool they used back in the 60s. They used arc welders. They didn't have MIG welders. They didn't have TIG welders. Arc welders did the job. They would build ships with arc welders. Arc welder is going to put a lot of heat into this forged piece of steel. It's going to get good, deep penetration. It should hold fine. It should never crack. There should never be another issue with this axle once we put it together. Okay, the point we're at now is we've cut our section out, we've ground, we've took a lot of steel out of here to make a nice big fillet weld all the way around. Now in addition to clamping it and bolting it back down, I've added another piece of steel across the back. What that's going to do is that's going to keep it square so that it doesn't do this as we're welding. Uh, I might even add a couple more clamps to it. And the other thing is, once we're done welding, we are not, we're going to leave all the clamps in place. We're going to let it cool all on its own. Don't ever throw any water or try to cool anything like this that you're welding that's this thick. You'll, you'll screw it up in a heartbeat. Let it naturally cool on its own. got pretty much all the welding done. We've taken the axle off of that custom jig that we made. Right now it's just cooling down a little bit. We're going to put the protractor on one spring perch pad. It looks like we're about a half a degree. We'll put it on the other side, match it up. That's about a half a degree there. Pretty good for cutting an axle in half and re-welding it. 
I don't think there's going to be any issues with the most important part, which is the caster and camber. I don't think that there's going to be anything wrong with that. It's going to be a good deal.